Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to listen to it again later. Following today's webinar, we'll be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our, our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll get to as many as we can before the end of today's event. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is four steps. How to value stream map your software pipelines. Our speaker today is Mark Hornbeek, who is the CEO of Engineering DevOps Consulting, author and what engineering DevOps, and I'm sure I got that all wrong, but sorry about that, Mark. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's uh, being joined by uh, Jeff Kais, who is Director of Product Marketing at Plutora. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Mark. How are you guys doing today? Hi. Wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I'm going to put myself on mute, let you guys get to it. Well, fantastic. I love this topic, by the way, and I'm just glad that I get to uh, walk this through. So you understand my perspective. I'll ask a lot of questions, but I'll ask it from a perspective of being a, uh, well, frankly, a, a programmer who's done it all wrong and wished he could persuade the whole room to develop pipelines in a certain way because I thought I knew what was right and struggle with getting people on board. And I remember reading Kent Beck about you should do value stream mapping. And I was like, ah, whatever. I never really got it. I didn't get it until later in life. What's fun about today is we get to work with Mark Hornbeek, who's done a lot of these sessions, who's worked through a methodic, methodical process of helping people through doing value stream mapping sessions. So thus, we have a series that we're doing of webinars. This one is the first, which is how do you set up a current state value stream map? and how do you run the process, after which we'll have a, a future state where you propose the solutions, and then we'll go through some examples <clears throat> in the third webinar about um, you know, some examples of, of key findings and so forth. So use this as your guide. You know, this is, if, you, if you've never done value stream mapping before, this is a great intro. If you have, um, okay, you'll get some new tidbits on where to go, how to do the calculations and so forth. Um, introducing Mark, He's coming out with a book, and this should be out in, is it, uh, well, gosh, in just another week here, right? Um, if you're going to Enterprise Summit in Vegas, you can actually stop by the Petora booth and pick up a copy. Um, you can also reserve a copy on Engineering DevOps, but it's a great book. Got a lot of cool blueprints on how you actually do DevOps transformations. Is that, is that uh, accurate, Mark? Anything you wanted to say about that? No, I should be paying you for the advertising, I guess. Uh, thanks <laughs> for the opportunity to talk here and uh, point that out, uh, sir. Sure. So, yeah, sure, pick up a free copy or order one online <laughs> would be even better. Awesome. Uh, but that this book was um, kind cool. of driven from the, um, you know, there was an interesting article published this morning. I blogged about it a little bit. You know, somebody said, has DevOps lost its groove? And the issue is that, a lot of people are frustrated, but we've been talking about DevOps for so long, but how do you actually do it? There's certainly lots of failure cases, probably more failure cases than success cases. So yep. <clears throat> uh, value stream mapping is central to the idea of engineering DevOps and you know, it provides a prescription for how do you actually do DevOps successfully, no matter where you're starting from or where you want to get to. It provides a prescription for that. It's kind of an engineering approach, more disciplined approach, and value stream mapping is central to that. So everything we're talking about here in this webinar is actually covered in the book in some portions of the book. Which is kind of cool, which takes us to what are you going to learn? Hey, what's a value stream map? Why do I care? Uh, yeah, how do you create them and what kind of results? Um, and ultimately, you've heard this, you're trying to find the bottlenecks and how do you improve those? So we're going to go through that. Um, so with that, what take us through this, Mark? What what's a value stream map? What give us the background here? How you know what's going on? Well, first of all, that's a good point. The background. I was looking at that this morning. Sorry, I just had a my uh, fans blowing my papers all over the place here. <laughs> 
I'm coming to you from lovely Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, in my uh, office. Anyway, um, value stream mapping is not new. It was, the, I think, the first examples that people point to were like 1918. A guy called Charles Nopel, uh, and he was just talking about you know how to document process flows mm -hmm. uh, for manufacturing in that case. And um, there's lots of interesting books in that been written since on value stream mapping. Probably the most recent one uh, on value stream mapping, in particular, is Karen Martin and Mike. Osterling, they wrote a book called Value Stream Mapping. Uh, value Stream Mapping has been applied to many, many things, uh, but it's essentially just a way of visualizing uh, a process flow um, mm -hmm. and makes it really easy to understand. So you define the steps in, the, in your process, try to not to make it too complex, even though in reality, we all know business processes are particularly complex. Um, and you know, if by doing that and doing it collaboratively, because all these processes usually involve a cross-functional team, um, so the idea is to really do this collaboratively, and you end up with a lot of you know learning that goes on about what your own processes are, and that helps you identify bottlenecks when it's applied to things like DevOps and you know software delivery, um, you know continuous delivery pipelines and things like that. So basically, it helps you with you know the idea of finding bottlenecks to pull out the you know the the waste mm -hmm. from a lean pipeline what i found interesting is i i mean how uh, are you surprised at how often people all get in a room and they don't really get the process that you know software goes through from backlog to to production and and how often how often are you seeing that where people are like oh i didn't know we do all those steps 100 percent of the time <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's always resistance, to like, oh, another meeting. Let's, do we have to go? <laughs> and then they get in the room, and actually, this is one of those meetings that tends to be really popular once you get into it. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. this is interesting. I didn't know we did it this way. I thought that only took you guys two days, or I thought it took you two months. You know, they, when you start mapping it out and realizing how things interact and interactions um, across the steps, and it's almost invariably enlightening for everyone. Somebody's learning something. So I, I actually find value stream map, the value stream map process and workshops fun. They, they, everybody seems to like them by the time they're done, even though they come into it sort of like wishing they didn't have to go to that meeting. <laughs> right. Well, because the first thought is it's just a waste of time. And, you know, that I, I got to get stuff done. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Why, why do I care? So, so how yeah. does, you know, doing this mapping fit into a DevOps transformation? Yeah, so one thing I would point out is, you know, the the simple value stream map that was presented on the previous slide, they always look kind of simple like that in the end, but in reality, there's a lot of complexities going on. And if you take DevOps, and I have this blueprint in my book, um, it's a multi-level thing. There, there, there are uh, value streams within value streams and interacting value streams. Mm -hmm. The idea is to try to pick a value that you're really trying to, you know, improve. But mm -hmm. uh, if you take the DevOps situation, uh, you know, at the, the lower end, you've got infrastructure that all the things run on, whether it's cloud or, or whatever. Um, and then you've got a pipeline of things mm -hmm. all the way from planning through the integration stages and, you know, delivery and operations. And then you've got release management. And then on top of that, you got value stream management orchestrating the whole, you know, the whole shebang. Um, sure. So you, you can have value streams at each of those levels and sub value streams, but uh, the idea is, if you're doing value stream mapping well, you you really think about what is the value stream that you're you, know, you really want to improve. Uh, where's the biggest bottleneck, most likely? Where's there you know the most interest in resolving the issues? And then you know it, all, it can all make sense. But keep in mind the big picture while you're doing it, because there's a lot of interactions going on. You do want to build a simple diagram. You don't want to end up with something too complex, or it's not really going to yep. be helpful. Right. But on the other hand, you want to make sure you pick the right level. Uh, so it's going to have the most value for you. Well, that's awesome. Let's get to the, so why? Why do I care about value stream mapping? It's really a great little tool. I mean, I remember even in like in college and everything, and until I could write write down the, you know, the the course in one diagram, I didn't really understand it. It's, if you can write down your process in one diagram, it's right. really powerful. Everybody right. can relate to it and say, yeah, I was there. I understand that. That makes sense. And uh, it, it really, you know, becomes a go-to diagram for uh, for things like uh, bottle strike, bottle, bottleneck identification improvements. But 
in general, you know, it gives you a way to also play with what if scenarios, what if you were to make this change, that change, you know, if, if that stage was faster or this, you know, stage delay was shorter, uh, you can start building future state models and then you can say, well, what would I have to do to get there? Uh, so it gives you a more objective way of tackling the end to end pipeline rather than just looking at it as, a, you know, oh, well, you know, what, what is the result? And then not really figuring out where, you know, where to tackle. Um, it applies to a lot of different things. Certainly it applies to software delivery pipelines and DevOps. And uh, the neat thing is if you build the value stream map, you can, you know, directly use it with value stream management tools. Um, you know, it's, it, it integrates well because you've already identified what stages need to be managed, for example. So value stream mapping has a lot of different values it also is just fun it's it's yep. some way to get the organization together do a little project together even if you don't have a cross-functional team structure um it's a way to get cross-functional team discussions going on in a way that's positive that's exactly what what i've observed is you know it's that when you get a cross-functional uh, a team looking at a problem, it unifies the team behind that single problem, which is we've got to solve whatever this problem X is. And yeah. everybody starts pointing to, you know, where they think the bottlenecks are, which is great. You know, if you're involved in wanting to fix things, now that you've immortalized, um, you know, what, what the process is and everybody's pointing to the same goal. Wow, yeah. what a great tool to get everybody on the same page for just a simple, uh, little diagram, you know, it does take a, a little bit of time, but so well in getting to what it takes to actually create it um, Well, how how do you how do you make one what <laughs> here's the here's the whole thing uh, in four steps how, how do you make a value stream map? So <laughs> there are different ways. I mean the book I mentioned um, it talks about different approaches and um, a lot of folks use a whiteboard or they use you know sticky notes and different things. What I do is I just use PowerPoint, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because then it doesn't require everybody's necessarily in the same room. You can do it over a webinar or just a you know a web meeting setting. Uh, so I have some templates. I go into the meeting with you know some templates of you know generic value stream and start capturing information and draw it and build build the diagram as you go and interactively with the team. I find that works really well. Uh, usually I can come up with a pretty comprehensive value stream map within a couple of hours you know no more than four um, with with a team typically size of you know anywhere from eight to 25 uh, is, is pretty normal um, and you can actually get a fair level of consensus if you build the diagrams together so that, that's a general point uh, the steps really are you know first of all it is a cross-functional effort so you do need to know who the players are um, you can't invite everybody to the room, uh, so you need to pick the players, and I'll talk about that. And then you need to prepare, uh, you know, get them ready, um, give them some collateral, maybe send them this webinar, for example, um, and tell them, you know, what what is it that you're going to be measuring that needs to be decided, and what's the value that you're going to build the value stream around, mm -hmm. and how are you going to measure those values? So I'll talk about that in a minute too. Uh, and then conduct the workshop. The workshop itself doesn't have to take more than, like I say anywhere from two to four hours typically. Uh, it doesn't have to be like an all day event. People could still do their day jobs, but uh, very collaborative, interactive effort. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's often action items taken. You find out that there's some data that you don't have, nobody has in the room, but you can figure it out and get it, uh, fill it in later. And finally, once you have all the data, which may usually, usually occurs a little bit later because some of that data might've been missing in the workshop, you, you can, you know, the or, or, or orchestrator of the, have the work and document the result and come back together and get a consensus on what it looks like. You bet. Hey, and you you put in a here a key question, a key piece, which is select a value to be analyzed. Can you mm -hmm. expand on that a bit? You know what what's that mean, and how do you get the team to understand you know what value is and and what's being delivered? So the you know the traditional value if value stream maps were designed for it would be like the product itself. Like there's some value that you're producing something and the customer wants it so that's the value the value is the product itself and what are the steps to get there but value stream mapping is used for a lot more than that uh, you can use the same technique which is what we're doing here uh, around any almost anything you pick a value and then you can say well let's map out the process for that thing it could be lead time it could be quality it could be even satisfaction or efficiency pick something that you want that you think is important to the group that you want to improve 
and identify that as a value. I have a slide on that as well later, um, but that's mm -hmm. the idea. You can have va different values throughout the organization that are important and they still interact. Um, that can get complex, but it's nice if you can all agree on what, you know, what, what is the value you're really trying to improve and build improvements around that. Gotcha. And is this like a one-time thing that you do? Or is this, um, uh, what's your, what's your cadence of this or what's it look like? Uh, you know, it's not waterfall days anymore. So basically you, you know, you, you, it's kind of uh, agile in the big picture sense. I mean, you, you do a value stream map for, you know, some leg in your DevOps journey and then revisit it before you go on to the next one. In theory, that's the best way to do it. So mm -hmm. you, you may, you may decide, Hey, wait a minute, we improved lead time. Now our bottleneck is quality or now our bottleneck is efficiency or stability or security. And maybe the next value stream map when you get together is so focus on those things instead. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What a great way to get the team together. So I guess this means we're going to have to have somebody that's going to lead the value stream mapping session. And I'm presuming that's going to be, you know, maybe a lot of the people on the line. So give it, what's it take to actually uh, understand, um, you know, how to lead a, a value stream mapping session? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of, politics in organizations and jealousies, I would say. Um, so you want a leader that is sensitive to those things. You, you, when you pull together a cross-functional team, you know, the, the, whoever's leading it needs to be, it's not just a technical discussion. It's, right. it's a human discussion around technical things and technical processes, but whoever the leader is needs to be someone that has that stature that he doesn't have to be the boss and maybe it's not a good idea to be the boss he needs to be a facilitator type personality that is sensitive to you know the particular organization's um sensitivities uh, there there's sometimes there are you know underlying politics going on right uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily want to put the elephant on the table but you want to be sensitive to it as you go through it um, right well because the yeah. goal is to draw people in right you want to get everybody collaborating yeah. So the person also needs to have some some understanding of the application that's being discussed. Clearly, you know, basic things like communication skills and understands the idea. So usually it's a senior consultant or someone in the organization that is equivalent to that mm -hmm. uh, to do a proper value stream exercise. Anybody can do it. I'm just saying that, you know, these are the characteristics that make it most successful typically. Yeah, people can call you and bring you in as well, um, just for a value stream mapping session too, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, we, we do offer workshops, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, well then, all right, who's who's going to be involved? Um, if we've got a leader that, we, that we've got that's, a, you know, a pro or we just want to practice, then great. But who all, who all do we want to have involved in this session? So again, it's a cross-functional effort. None of these processes, if it was only one person involved, then I guess you wouldn't need the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Fundamentally, you know, there's, you're going to have some management players. You're going to have some key influencers that maybe not in a management level, but they're influencers regarding the particular, whatever the value is. You, it, it's all about the value again. If, if the value is lead time, then pick people that are that can contribute to, you know, lead time discussions, right? How, how fast things are take and how to speed them up. So you're often going to have the product owner, certainly you're going to have people from you know, the different portions of the of the end-to-end -end value stream. So it's usually in the DevOps world, it's going to be dev and ops and the tools people, infrastructure, QA, management, people that have release authority. They're all going to have some stake in the game when you start talking about changing the value stream, even just to document the current one, they're going to have information that's important. Um, now, don't worry about their titles. It's more important that you get the right people. Yep. And really try to ensure that the people that attend are the are, are of a nature to be cooperative and not if if they are a political sort, you know, they need to have some pre-coaching to put aside their political attitudes prior to the meeting because there's that's so disruptive when you get one person trying to dominate the meeting because of their personal, you know, biases. Um, so that that's important too. Yeah, I. You know, I, I hope what you're hearing out of this is the um, requirement to enlist because, as it said, you know, culture eats process for lunch. So mm -hmm. if if you're trying to make a technology change, oftentimes it's the culture change and the personalities that you're trying to influence. And this is as much about that and getting people involved as it is about actually fixing the process. 
Well, um, yeah, I, I would interrupt there a little bit because it's so important. Um, often I have found that these value stream mapping sessions are the first time <laughs> Some people have got together across their organization. They've complained about each other for years. Right. <laughs> and then they finally come into a meeting that actually do a little project together and they come out of the room a little more friendly to each other. It's actually, Which is, it's, it's like yeah. you're playing camp counselor, right? You know, okay, kids, stop fighting and let's find a way to work together. Which is why your leader is so important. He's got to be able to bridge yeah. that gap. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, well, looking at the kind of things that I want to analyze, um, give me a walkthrough of some of these. I mean, you you kind of mentioned these, but uh, tell me what these kind of mean. Well, these are the items that I you I often refer to in you know, certainly in the book and the DevOps my DevOps practice. But um, there are six categories of values or uh, or goals you could call them um, in DevOps that are these are derived from the state of the DevOps report. Mm -hmm. um, so you can identify them as time to market, quality, stability, efficiency, security, satisfaction. So there's literally six, and, the, and and there are some, you know, refinements on each of those. But those are basically the primary values that I see people wanting to improve. Uh, time to market is by by, by far and wide the, the most right. popular one. Yeah, go faster, right? Time, go faster. <laughs> uh, you know, and then usually quality follows behind that because as you go faster, you find out that things break. Right. Uh, so, so that comes the next one, but and they often try to do both at the same time. You, you know, you're trying to take care of everything as you go, but right. in reality, if you try to focus on six things at once, it doesn't work. You focus on one, and then you know you checkpoint the others to make sure they don't get worse at least. Mm -hmm. um, so time to market, for example, you're usually looking at the process time, how long it takes to process an item, uh, how long it takes, you know in calendar time to do that, which may be a different time. It may take you only two minutes to do something, but um, you know that two minutes has to be scheduled, so the total task might be a day. Um, uh, even So process time is two minutes and lead time is a day. And right. then there may be wait times as well. Like I can't start it until Fred is finished with he's, what he's doing. Um, so those are examples of measurements. It's not just not good enough just to identify a value. You also have to agree on what how you're gonna measure it that's important for the analysis in these value stream maps. Gotcha. Yeah. gotcha, gotcha. So how do you decide between, you know, where, where to start? What, what's your process? So, yeah, so this is, just, this was actually from the prior webinar we did together. The, um, a, a lot of people disagree on what the value should be. And that's, that's typically the starting point. Like how do we agree on what is the value? So we actually have a little tool uh, that walk through, you know, again, collaboratively with the team. Uh, all the different types of goals or values and get them to force rank it and then say, okay, if that's the, do we all agree that, you know, let's say in, in this particular diagram, agility was the number one. So we're going to focus on that. Sure. Uh, yeah. So this is a good way to kind of get a, alignment on the value before we start making a map of it. So see prior webinar and uh, you can learn about yeah. this tool more. Well, exactly. and that kind of takes us into actually doing the workshop. You know, when, when we're doing this, um, I, I mean, here's the most fundamental question, right? How, how do I decide what the stages are? Uh, you yeah. know, that's a tough one sometimes. I mean, although um, it usually requires a little bit of coaching. There, mm -hmm. there, there's some science, if you like, pseudoscience <laughs> behind it. A stage really should be something that has a defined start and defined end. Okay. And, there, there may even be some overlap between the start of one and the end of the other, but there should be at least some criteria that says, okay, that part is done. If there mm -hmm. isn't, it's kind of hard to call it a stage. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and so then if you have, you know, a defined stage, and there, there shouldn't be too many either, by the way. If it gets too complex, then this uh, doesn't work. It's, you know, it's a visual tool. So there are software tools out there that can handle value streams with hundreds of steps, but that's not really, I don't find that very helpful. Unmanageable at that point. It's not right? manageable. It's not really, I haven't found that very helpful. It's better to get it down to like five to 15 steps, something you can actually put on a diagram. Uh, I kind of try to keep it under 10, um, <clears throat> but the idea is to try to pick, you know, something with, break it down into like 15 steps maximum, 
Yeah. And each stage has a defined start, a defined end, even if there's some overlap, but at least you can define when one is done. Uh, and you can also define the input criteria for the next one. So to me, that's the definition of a stage. It has a defined input criteria and it has a clear you know, uh, definition of when it's done that can be measured. Gotcha. One of the critiques I hear, of course, is, oh, well, that seems really waterfallish, and we're doing agile. Yeah. I, you know, what? How do you respond to that? Yeah. So indeed, you know, it's, it, people I think overuse this word waterfall, but fundamentally, waterfall is nothing other than, uh, you know, you do everything serially and you don't start the next thing until you finish the last thing. And this diagram sort of implies that, so I can understand why the question exists. But I don't care whether it's agile or waterfall or whatever. You still have to do, you know, one thing before you finish the other. You can't, you know, test the code before you have the code, for example. Um, mm -hmm. There are things that have logical steps. And in the case of DevOps, they're fairly they're fairly obvious. Typically, right. you know, you're going to you're going to plan before you code. You're going to code before you you know, before you finish testing, at least, um, you know, there's certainly TDD and all of that, but you're not going to finish system testing until you have the code and, you know, you're going to do integration and you're going to have packaging for delivery and you're going to have a delivery and you're going to have operations. So there are actually steps, whether it's agile or not. So I do, you know, argue that this is not waterfall, even though it does tend to look like a serial diagram. Uh, yep. It's still useful to break it down this way. Understood. And I'm noticing some metrics there at the bottom. You talk about that a bit, this LTPT. Right. So lead time is nothing other than um, the time, you know, calendar time for a process. So let's say it was integration. If integration, if you submitted a, you know, commit to a build system and, and it took, uh, you know, an hour to make a build, that the lead time would be an hour. Okay. Whereas maybe the actual time it was being using using the computer was only 10 minutes because the, the computer's shared with others. So the process time is only 10 minutes. So you can see that there's a waste, there's an efficiency there. From the point of view of this particular, that particular value stream, that's only 10% efficient at that stage because you know, you're waiting 90% of the time for the chance to run the build. <laughs> so that's just an example of what that means. Non-value added time is really just wait time um, in between stages. Um, so if you were, let's say, uh, you got code ready, but you want to test it, but you don't have the test environment yet, so you request it, and eventually it comes available, and then you can start. So you can't start the next stage. That's what non-value added time is. And then the other little thing I can never remember what it means myself. C over A, but I know what I, I know what it means. I don't remember the acronym. The percent complete and accurate. Yeah. It's, the general idea is that it's the percent of the results of the prior stage that are usable without rework. So it's an indication of quality. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you had a C over A of, of uh, 90%, then 90% of the results from the prior stage is usable in the stage without rework. That's, you know, if it was 10%, I'd say that the previous stage is a serious problem, like only 10% right. of the work is usable. Um, so that's what it means anyway. Awesome. Well, and looking at this, you know, how do you identify, you know, the tactics to support those, you know, the improvements? Because it's, uh, what kinds of things are you asking about when you're looking at, you know, what's going on in each stage? So when you do the value stream map, you shouldn't only, often the engineers in the room want to talk about just the technical piece, but, you know, you've really got to also think about what's contributing to the bottlenecks What's contributing to whatever the value is, if it's mm -hmm. you know if it's quality or whatever it is, and don't just think about the tech piece. You know, think about your process and the people, and make sure you jot down all of those things that are contributing factors that are you know prevalent factors. Um, that's all this chart is really saying. So don't yeah. don't just think about the technology. In, in other words, just because the tool that particular tool only does this doesn't mean that's the only way to you know look at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Works. It may be that there's some people stuff that's dominating the delay more than the technology. Um, you know, maybe it's because, you know, Fred takes vacation a lot <laughs> or something. <laughs> right. Whatever right. reason, right? Or maybe it's because that particular conference room that you always meet in is always busy. Um, whatever the whatever it is, right? It may not be just tech. It may not be. You can't only look at the tech. Well, let's look at this in practice then. So, um, putting all these things together, what? What's an example of lead time and, and 
you know, show me how this all kind of fits together. It, give me a layout. What's going on here? Yeah, so this is an actual example. I can't name names, but this is a financial services company um, where we d we viewed one of the, one of their applications, um, pipeline value stream, and uh, they this is a high level map of of that. Um, the team reviewed the, at the backlog level. Uh, they were reviewing priorities and resources and assignments, and that's what was consuming the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a manual review at the dev stage. It was basically coding, inspecting, unit testing, and all of that. So you basically jot down what are the major contributing factors to, in this case, lead time. Um, and they came up with some numbers, uh, four hours of uh, lead time and one hour of process time. And a lot of the difference was, hey, we needed to get together for the meeting. We had to gather people together. So the difference mm -hmm. between four and one was basically getting people together. And you can kind of go through the rest of the stages and see the same thing. The dev stage looks like it's very long, 72 hours to, to make a change. Um, and 48 hours of, the, of that was actual process time. The rest of it was you know, getting ready and getting your environment set up and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the CI stage, uh, 18 hours um, of actual lead time and six hours of process time. So you can sort of look at that and say, whoa, uh, where are the big times being spent? It looks like dev is you know, a big one and operations is a, a big one. Um, maybe that's where you should make improvements. The delays and non-value added times look like um, between dev and CI, you got a request for waiting for resources for testing and again between delivery and deployment sure waiting for resources for deployment um so these are the sort of things you do you just write down your you know your, your stages then figure out what are the contributing factors and how long are those things taking gotcha well and a question on that i mean where where do these numbers come from how, how did you get data for this well <clears throat> yeah it's obviously it's, you know a current state survey so people have to come with their numbers and often okay. they I mean, I have them. There may be a homework assignment to go get them, or a couple of phone calls. It's usually the case, um, and they may be estimates. And to be honest with you, the absolute numbers are not as important as the relative numbers because what you're trying to look for is percent improvement overall. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing is that the team is comfortable with the represent representative, at least on a relative scale, of what their value stream looks like. If they have absolute numbers. That's cool, but in reality, there's almost no such thing as absolute numbers anyway. They tend to vary. If you have a small change going through, it might only take minutes. A big change might take days. Mm -hmm. These are kind of like the team's estimate of their average. Um, and the most important thing is that they can stand back and look at it and say, yeah, this does seem to fairly represent our typical case, at least on a relative scale. Gotcha. And yeah. just to make sure I got these numbers right, for example, on the backlog, you got four hours of, of uh, lead time mm -hmm. with one hour process time, which leads to three hours of waste um, and right on through. What's this 80% number here? Well, that's the C over A. That's the percent of those changes that were, were accepted without change. So, so and how do you get words, that? Back, Where's that? Back, again, it's, it's from just talking to the team and they okay. may have metrics on some of these things. Some of them may not actually have metrics, but in, if it was an agile tool, they might be able to see how many of their now, Jira or something, how many of their changes are getting rejected and require rework from the tool. Uh, that may not be true in every step, right? Because as you go through the whole value stream, there's different tools involved typically. So usually it's, you know, that's why you need the cross-functional team. Whoever's the local expert for that area needs to come up with some numbers. Sure. And it's it's somewhat subjective, but it's going to use data as a background yeah. for it to kind of say, well, we think it's about this and you'll get real yeah. numbers at that. OK, yeah. mm -hmm. well, so, you know, how do you calculate these lead time? And uh, let's talk about calculating lead time and process time then. Right. So the main thing I want to point out here is, you know, the math is simple. I don't think going through the math is that helpful, but I want to point out that what you're really trying to do is not. <clears throat> Uh, you know, over focus in one area. Excuse mm -hmm. me. <clears throat> um, you're really trying to optimize end to end. So the first thing you want to do is uh, reevaluate all of these numbers in terms of its end to end significance, right? So it's not. If you were to just look at the raw numbers, you might say, "Oh, what's most important is that 72-hour number. It's a big, right. you know, time." But in reality, the dev stage in this case 
it's fairly efficient. You know, 48 hours process time, 72 hours lead time. Mm -hmm. It's 67 percent efficient. There may not be a lot of low hanging fruit there to improve, but the CI stage, which is only 18 hours. It's only 33% efficient, so it may be faster uh, and easier to make some improvements there. Uh, depending on what your goals are, that may be enough. So that's something to constantly look at when you're doing the analysis. You know, where's the low-hanging fruit? Where are you most likely going to get easy gains? And usually it's going to be where you've got, you know, a larger difference between the, as a ratio between the process time and the lead time. Um, and then, of course, the total waste is still interesting. Uh, so if you can think of a good way to attack total waste, then that 24-hour waste is valuable to look at, right? Um, mm -hmm. The other thing to look at is where you've got common factors. So the non-value time of 16 hours uh, it by itself may not be huge, but it's still significant. If you look at the fact that really the same thing's going on uh, between dev and CI and delivery and deploy, it's really an environment orchestration problem. Uh, the total is very significant. So yep. you want to look for those opportunities as well, where there's some common, a common solution might address uh, some of these smaller numbers. Uh, and then in total, they become worth, you know, addressing. You total them up and say, wow, that, as a total, as a total percentage of your end-to-end -end, uh, waste, it's significant. And maybe that's what you should tackle. So that's why you, you do want to do a few what if calculations at this point before you decide where you're going to focus solutions. Um, that's great. So, uh, what do you end up with then when you you know you're getting this done? How how do you you know when you, when you're doing this say for a different thing than than lead time and you're going to do quality? Yeah. What's it look yeah, like? So, yeah, so quality is <clears throat> in this diagram at least it's a little easier because if you got if you got to boil down to the C over A, the you know percent of time, percent of, of results that are usable, <clears throat> it's pretty much just taken right off the chart. You can say what the what are the biggest biggest areas uh, for improvement. In this case, the the lowest numbers are most important. Mm -hmm. So 65 percent, 55 percent are areas that improve. And just be aware that you know you're talking about improvements in the prior stage, not the current stage in this case. So if if 65 if only 65 percent of the output of dev is passing CI, then you want to look at your dev process and see what can we improve so that we can get that number up. You bet. Well, give us some key tips. You know, as as you've done this, what? Uh, give us some. I you know, give us some wisdom. <laughs> yeah, so I, I sort of alluded to some of that as I went along. The most important thing is again, don't just look at the individual numbers. Look at them as a ratio of the end-to-end -end values because you're really trying to optimize end-to-end -end flow, not just an individual stage. So give priority in your solution in the solutions to things that have a high, you know, impact end-to-end. -end. Um, be concerned about. Um, don't be so concerned about the absolute precision because it doesn't really exist anyway. Mm -hmm. What's most important is the team can stand back and look at it and say, yeah, this seems to be representative of our current state typically. There's always going to be outliers. There's no point in spending a whole lot of time talking about outliers. You're trying to find out what's the typical case and make sure the team is uh, you know, satisfied that that's a fair representation. Uh, do look for back-to-back -back bottlenecks. Sometimes when you've got maybe the individual bottlenecks are not that high, but if you total three major, you know, significant bottlenecks in a row, there may be some opportunity. There's maybe a common common solution that can you can get a lot of gains for low effort. Um, sure. And then the common areas as well, where you've got things like I mentioned, um, where you've got fairly small waste values, but it, uh, one solution would tackle multiple. Uh, multiple instances in the in total it's worth solving mm -hmm. so those are just some examples of things that you know are not obvious at first glance when you're doing these things very cool well um we were going to do a survey but i'm going to ignore that so we're going to get right into <coughs> all right take us through a real life example give us the story here because this is interesting <clears throat> This is an actual customer, uh, Digital Archive. I won't mention the name of the customer. And again, typical case, you know, you get into the room and a lot of, we had um, fair representation. Not everybody in this case was represented in the meeting from all different cross-functional groups, but there was a fair representation. And uh, 
a lot of disagreement as to what the actual process was mm -hmm. and getting it, getting it boiled down to um, you know these numbers and these content um, so that's back to the surprise of you do what <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so the first thing was to decide what are we trying to improve mm -hmm. uh, you know was it all the way end to end from backlog through to delivery or not and the, we agreed that no it's going to be we're going to look at the lead time between uh, start of function well basically the end of coding and unit test until delivery mm. is ready um, so that's the first thing, you know, lesson learned. Make sure you know what is what is the segment of the value stream that you're really going to focus on. Sure. Um, and then you really break, the, you know, jump into that. So we we found out that the in the function and acceptance test stage after uh, see after code in unit testing, there were there was a lot of manual testing going on, even creating the test. So they didn't have the test at the end of coding. Uh, so there's clearly an opportunity there to make some improvements to parallel test creation with coding. Um, and then preparing for the deployment uh, at the time, at the same time as integration, the, so the parallel effort is good, but the problem is some of the integration artifacts aren't, aren't available yet. Um, mm -hmm. So there's some mismatch in timing uh, and system integration and performance. After integration does make sense. Um, and, you know, it's, fairly low amount of total time, but in this case, we're dealing with a fairly short total time anyway. The, their current state was only 14 hours um, and trying to get it down to seven hours. Mm. Uh, deployment, <clears throat> um, to try to get the deployment process a little more automated. Uh, at the moment, they was using tickets, uh, so there'd be a, an opportunity to automate that uh, with things like value stream mapping tools, automating the and orchestrating the actual process. Mm -hmm. uh, and validating what's been deployed, so automating some of the deployment scripts um, and tests post-deployment are all opportunities. Um, when you get down to lead times of 14 hours, you're trying to, you know, you're clearly getting to a situation where you, you're talking about automation. You, you, not a lot of manual processes are going to make improvements in 14 hours. So it's pretty much all an automation play. Where, where do we want to concentrate our automation efforts? And there's also some opportunity for restructuring the pipeline. Um, if you look, like I mentioned, the, you know, maybe the function test and acceptance testing could come together with coding. And so yeah. you have more like a CI automated kickoff rather than manual work and uh, things like that. Yeah. Wow. So that one's pretty simple and they're already doing pretty well if they're just looking yeah. at a lead time of 14 hours. Let's look at mm -hmm. one that's a little more messy. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think this is where most of the enterprises are. It's like, oh my gosh, what am I? <laughs> Walk us through this one. Yeah, so this is definitely more messy. This is a, a large financial firm, um, and the red is basically where they aren't really using best practices. <laughs> so there's a lot of red in every one of the stages. Uh, again their starting point goals were not realistic. Their estimate of their current state was also not realistic. When we started mapping it out, we found out that there's, you know, the, the current state is taking a lot longer than they estimated. Again, it was a lead time, a, a value, value that was being analyzed. Um, a lot of time in test creation and coding again. This one mm -hmm. comes up a lot, honestly. Many organizations just haven't got, they haven't invested in tests what I call continuous testing best practices, uh, mm -hmm. which is more than just test automation. It's also, you know, the way you create tests, the way you analyze tests. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, in this situation, they were they were actually training the testers after the code was written. So uh, a lot of ways just waiting for people to get trained so they can write the tests. Um, they really weren't following the traditional CI you know, CICD pipeline model. Uh, so things were happening out of order. Uh, functional testing uh, was being done uh, together with regression testing and integration testing. And um, it, there, there wasn't any demarcation really between those. Uh, so there was a lot of issues with trying to sort out what problems are happening for where you didn't have like a hierarchy of uh, dependencies that you could identify. Um, so test analysis was very messy. A lot of wait time again between setting up environments. So you couldn't finish their acceptance until the users accepted it. So the, 
that you but you didn't have direct control of the users so setting up the users to test was a big delay um, so the solution here was to again re-architect re-architect the pipeline a little bit make it more of a traditional ci cd pipeline mm -hmm. and apply automation to test orchestration and uh, or setting up the user acceptance testing and also orchestrating the uh, the involvement of users get them ready before uh, you know before you before they have to do it don't just tell them at the time but do right. some work you know, warn them <laughs> well one more we'll look at and you yeah. know it, interesting enough we'll we'll get into these in the next webinar some of the remediation that was done mm -hmm. yeah. um, but let's let's look at another even messier one yes again a large insurance company um, Huge effort on testing, completely separate test organization. Uh, during the meeting, we had a lot of trouble getting agreement as to, uh, you know, what the times were and even what their process was. You know, <laughs> there were so many components to their testing, and testing for development was totally separated by from the other t testing. And there were there were different testing groups that were practically unaware of each other. Um, so again, the huge bottleneck here had to do with the way they were doing testing, the order in which they were doing it, the way the tests were identified, the way that the tests were being reviewed and executed, a lot of manual testing. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the bottlenecks, the, the main bottleneck was testing and test environments. Uh, I find that happens a lot, actually. Yeah. It's often, often the, uh, the bottleneck with these large firms when they, you're dealing with complex, uh, multi-tiered, uh, you know, products that have legacy components and other things pulling together an environment for that to test and then running the tests can be very complex yep absolutely and what's interesting is you know you're you're not trying to call somebody's it, you're not calling out anyone you're just saying overall this is what we currently do and here's the timings yeah. and it gives right. everyone an opportunity to go yeah so when you're doing that and you know obviously you have to start planning for what are you going to fix and you know, it, maybe it seems obvious, but you know how. Well, in that last one, it was kind of scary. In fact, they they practically ran out of the room at one point. Everybody like, oh my God, we're not going to make our upcoming release because now we see how long things take. Right. And we're we're not going to make. This is telling us we're not even going to come close to meeting our deadlines. I had a feeling that everybody was running to write their resumes or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, that's an interesting aspect. If you find that your current processes are that bad step up your own career because you can help this process wherever you are yeah. you know take this on a bit but you know all right well so uh, how do i you know how do i know what areas i should focus on to fix so again it's you know it's an analysis you sit down and you say well what are all these stages really taking and you try to get consensus as well again there's no such thing as absolute numbers i'd love to be the engineer with just a calculator doesn't work right you have to involve people because none of these things are black and white and nailed down to that degree you have right. some data some portions of the value stream you're going to have better data than other portions mm -hmm. but you try to get the best data you can you're typically going to get that data from the people that are closest to the data and then you're going to have to rely on it you get back together and you just literally list out you know what here's what i'm finding this is what seems to be ranked the ranking, if I just look at the numbers, you can look at what, where are the biggest improvements going to come from if you solve those, uh, you know, if, if you attack those bottlenecks and get agreement. Um, yep, that looks like the biggest one, so we'll tackle that, right? And the, and that becomes the basis for a future state value stream map. This The output of a current state value stream mapping exercise is to give input to a future state value stream mapping exercise. <coughs> And we're not going to go into that a whole lot in this webinar. That's the next webinar. But that's the general idea. Again, try to bring people along because it is a collaborative multi yep. multi team thing. And try to, you know, present the present the data and get alignment as you go along so that it's, you know at the end you get acceptance of the result. Absolutely. Well, and this is what we'll talk about are some of the key bottlenecks and we'll mm -hmm. I will save this for next time um as we look at, at future state. But yeah. um you know, there's there's a lot here that we can do as you start. Well, what are the strategies to actually reduce that? Here's your key bottlenecks. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, we'll get into some of these strategies because that's where the cool. And I'm assuming for those on the line, if I want to learn some of these things, I bet there's a book that I could read that would help me uh, learn some of this stuff. Isn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> engineering, <laughs> engineering DevOps. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, <clears throat> and this is, uh, you know, a future state as a teaser for what we'll talk about next time of, right. of actually here's where the next set of changes were. Um, and we'll talk about real cases that that was uh, happening in. Um, kind of buttoning this up, it, just to give us a few minutes for questions. Uh, I love this discussion because it's it's looking at delivery of software from a perspective of value stream. So we, at the end of the day, we're all here to deliver value and Forrester helped coined the term of value stream management as a platform to help deliver software and manage the delivery regardless of the number of tools or methodology. And that's what we're talking about here. I know we've been talking about DevOps. And I know we've been talking about value stream mapping, but it hasn't necessarily applied only to DevOps. It applies to any methodology to help move them and transition towards DevOps. It's yeah. funny, at the end of the day, you can make a lot of transitions and somebody's gonna say, have you done any better than you're doing before? I know we're more DevOpsy than we were before, but is it better? Unless you've got something in place to actually prove that, um, it's going to be hard uh, to justify. What Platora does is we are a value stream management platform. We sit as a SaaS-based solution that integrates into your current um, delivery tool chains, pulling that data in and normalizing and correlating the data together. We have management orchestration on top of that. Um, allowing you to uh, ensure standardized processes with everything and really to uh, take the workload off of individuals that are trying to do this stuff manually, enabling you to do this at scale and enabling you to do it for autonomous teams or legacy teams. And the best part about this is you get massive analytics because we put all that into a uh, cloud-based analytics engine that you can then follow your nose, finding problems and finding bottlenecks and getting some of the metrics that we just talked about. And of course, you can have you know oversight with the pipeline. You get um, predictive analytics on how well you're doing. Start answering some really key and interesting questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to go to our final slide, which is questions. And there are a few questions. If you've got any more questions, Ask them now because uh, you you got Mark here to to answer them for you. But um, so I'll, I'll just throw in with the first one. Um, uh, there's a question. Hey, VSM has been done a long time in lean manufacturing. So what are some of the key differences between lean manufacturing um, or typical waterfall and DevOps when you're doing value stream mapping? Uh, well. The content is obviously different, uh, you know, what what it is you're mapping um, and just the knowledge of the application and the processes involved. Uh, but otherwise, there's not really that much different, frankly. It's the same methodology being applied to CI, CD and software. It's th you can apply value stream mapping to segments of a other value stream. You can have a supporting value stream. So, you know, you could say Ag if you looked at Agile as more of a way of optimizing Mostly the dev end of the process, um, but you know certainly with the more recent scaled agile and all of that, it, it's more end to end. Uh, but value stream mapping applies in all of those cases. There's really, I can't say there's a difference. It's really, you know, it's really the way you apply it, right, and what you're applying it to in the content. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, but it's another way of saying that. I, I think another thing you would say is that you know. Hey, you still have steps in the process. Maybe the names of the stages are different, but um, you're still looking at, you know, you got to build it. It's like you mentioned before, you got to build it before you test it. And some tasks are going to be automated, some are not. And so your, your phases will be different. And yeah. another related question is, you know, isn't one of the keys uh, to identifying bottlenecks is identifying and agreeing um, on the inputs to the processes and that are the outputs to, you know, the next process? Certainly, yeah. I mean, when you're sitting down for the at the beginning of the value stream mapping session, you typically that's what you're usually doing, right? Saying what are what are the stages, and you, you know, the moderator, the expert, or consultant in the room will help you through that. But it's a discussion of okay, if, let's test to see whether these stages you're telling me are in fact sufficiently defined, and do they have a defined input? Do they have a defined output? And an exit criteria is is the main thing I look for. 
a, a follow-on question to that is, um, you know, how much time do you spend on really making sure you define the inputs and the outputs and making sure there's alignment on that? Well, <clears throat> it's the, the amount of time is going to vary depending on what the contribute to what extent is it going to contribute to the value. So you're not trying to enlist and list every input and every output for a stage. It's all about the particular value. So if the value is lead time, you're only going to, you know, enumerate those things that are specifically relevant for lead time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if the value is quality, then, it's, you know, so that's, again, where the expertise of the of the leader comes into play. Because uh, you're right, you, you can get off on a tangent very easily with this stuff right. and start enumerating things that really aren't that meaningful relative to the particular value that's being mapped. That, yeah, it's all about what's, what is that value and, and keep to that point throughout the whole exercise. You bet. Yeah. Um, there's a question about um, uh, value stream mapping versus doing a, a DORA assessment. Um, can you kind of compare and contrast? Well, assessments, <clears throat> I do assessments, um, that's part of my practice. And as part of the assessment, I do value stream mapping. But assessments involve things like gathering current state. Uh, there are other aspects of current state that may not be relevant for a value stream uh, assessment. Um, but, um, you know, to me, value stream mapping is just one tool that you could use if you're doing assessments thoroughly. It's not the other way around. I wouldn't do value stream mapping alone uh, without doing some form of an assessment because you're going to miss some other relevant things. Uh, so like, for example, goal setting and uh, organizational structure and all the things that are relevant for DevOps that may not show up in purely a value stream map exercise. So uh, I see value stream mapping as one tool in a set of tools associated with proper assessments. Assessments tend to be a little more 360 degrees, whereas value stream mapping tend to zoom in on particular values that you're trying to improve. And usually the assessment is what helps you decide what that is. So the value stream map tool usually gets pulled up partway into an assessment. Yep. You know, and on that note, from a Platora side, some of the analytics that we have, we not only do we give you a value stream, you know, map in essence, your lead time, process time, but mm -hmm. out of that, we can already calculate the, you know, deployment frequency, mean time to repair, and a lot of those things because we have all the data. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so there's a lot of crossover between the two, but you know, the, the assessment, it just says, here's four metrics. The value stream map actually looks at the whole process and says, um, you know, there's a lot more that you can change because it's not just looking at the tooling. You're looking at the people, you're looking at the process and the tooling. Um, it's kind of cool how you do that. Um, it looks like just a couple more questions. Uh, when you're doing a value stream mapping session, uh, any advice for how many, um, values, and I think really what meant to say is how many goals that you should focus on? I like it to be one. Uh, I'll allow two, but three is a no. It's too complicated. You know, I usually say, let's try to pick one, but there are cases where people have trouble agreeing on just one. So you, you look at maybe two, It then the it gets more complicated. It takes longer. Uh, and then the, or, the strength of the moderator is really important in that case because people tend to bounce back and forth between the different values so i tend to like one yeah understood uh there's a note saying wait time equals coffee time how do you motivate people to give up coffee time <laughs> true uh, point <laughs> you put you put alcohol on their at their cubicles <laughs> <laughs> true point <laughs> um well this has been great a lot of good stuff uh, questions about the book, I will uh, come by the booth at DevOps Enterprise Summit. Come connect with me. Uh, Mark will also be roaming there at uh, Enterprise Summit. Um, for the book, I can, uh, well, uh, e email me afterwards and I can, I can get you connected with that um, as well. But uh, very much, Mark, thank you for the time. This has been fantastic. And uh, over to you, Charlene. All right, great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. So thanks to you both for uh, for being on today's webinar. I also want to thank the audience for uh, so many great questions. If we didn't get to your question, please know that the folks at Plotora will be getting a copy of all the questions, so I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. 
I also want to remind the audience real quick that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the session, or if you just want to watch it again, you can do that. We'll be sending out an email later today that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. The webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars. Look in the on demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. Um, while you're there, please check out the other webinars that we have, both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be something there that piques your interest. Again, Jeff, Mark, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. And this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.